morning. Um, today's scripture comes from Genesis 2, verse 18. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. This is the word of the Lord. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. And I, today is the first Sunday of the year, but it's on the 7th, so it kind of feels like uh, it's not that new anymore, but it's still new, right? Um, I'm going to be uh, talking about how we are created uh, for community, and um, I think we need to understand uh, the calling that God has for us. You know, it's the new year, and you know we could be thinking like, oh, for the coming year, I want to do this, I want to do that, I should get this done, I should try this. Uh, and you can be making all these plans, uh, but the question is, are you making this plan with God according to his will for you and his plan for you? Or are you making your plans apart from God and then simply asking God to just bless it? You know, God is not your... Uh, AI or, 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 you know, like helper who is standing there uh, just waiting for your call to come and help you every time you snap your finger. No, he is your God. He is your Lord. And what we should be seeking to do is to discover his will, his heart, and his plan, and that we get to be part of that and that we join that. Um, how was your holidays? I know that, uh, you know, for people like me, uh, struggle with weight, like holidays are the worst, you know, because there's just so many get togethers and so many desserts and snacks and they're like, oh, you know, like it, it's so hard. Uh, and then sometimes you're already full and then they bring out like this decadent dessert and, you know, you know, you find yourself saying like, I wish I had another stomach, you know. Uh, and I know that Hannah has another stomach for ice cream because, uh, you know, she could say that she is completely full up to here, but when ice cream comes out, she can eat it because she has a separate stomach. And I think they, they explain it like this, right, that when your brain sees something that is so desirable to you, then it sends message to your digestive system, make room. You better make room because this is good stuff. And so when you see it, your, 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 your digestive system goes into overdrive and starts to really make room. And that is why even though you feel full, you could actually eat more desserts. Well, ants have two stomachs. Did you guys know that? Let's look at another slide. I think ants are very interesting. <coughs> now, these guys, you know, they're, they're not like kissing. But what they're doing is sharing, <coughs> sharing energy. So these are worker ants. And so when a worker ant gets tired or weary, he will go up to a fellow ant and say, hey, give me some. I, I, I'm low on energy. And then the other worker ant will actually vomit up nutrients. And so it, it, it is you know, feeding the other ant of the nutrient that is needed. And the reason they are able to do this is in their anatomy, right? So this is their digestive tract. And as you see, the digestive tract will go first to what they call social stomach. And then from there, it will go to their normal stomach and then out, right? So it has two stomachs. First stomach is called the social stomach. And this is where it stores the nutrients and energy that it can share with other ants. And, and then, you know, the yellow part is the, their normal uh, inner stomach. Uh, the reason I talk about the ants is because they, they study these ants, and, you know, ants have colonies. And so if an ant, worker ant, is separated from its colony, they, they say the life expectancy of that working ant is about six to seven days. But if that ant remains intact within the colony, it will live up to 66 days like 10 times longer because 
it is able to share back and forth the nutrients it needs to sustain itself and to continue to work and continue to be productive. So an ant outside the colony, because it has no use for its social stomach and it receives no uh, nutrients from other ants, it will die in a week. But if it stays in the colony and sharing these nutrients back and forth, it will stay alive 10 more times, right? And so when you study the Bible, God creates, and he creates the universe, and he creates us, and then the rest of the story is God inviting us to be in a relationship with him, but not only that, but that we belong to a community. We are created for community, and within that community, we are also to have deep, meaningful relationship with one another. Next slide. Uh, so these are the six days of God's creation, right? First day, God said, let there be light, and he created the light, and it was good. And second day, he split the sea and the sky, and he saw that it was good, and it was good. And the third day, he, he made the land arise, and the, he caused the plants to grow, and it was good. And on the fourth day, he created the sun and the moon and the stars to mark the times and the seasons, and it was good. And on the fifth day, he made the fish and all the birds, and it was good. On the sixth day, he created all the animals on the planet, and then he created us. And it was very good. Right, so there's a pattern here where the Bible is saying, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's very good. But then on the very next chapter, it says, it's not good. Making a very powerful case against something that it should be really highlighted because it's really bad. It's really dangerous. And so in order to say this is really bad... The Bible is aligning all six days of creation. Good, 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 good. Very good. And then, boom, it's bad. What's bad? To be alone. And this text and you know, what follows after, it's not simply about marriage, but it's about humanity, how we were created by God. And God is inviting us to have the relationship with him and with one another. And so, it is not good that the man should be out. Next slide. Right? So, Genesis chapter 2, he says, It is not good that the man should be alone, and I will make him a helper fit for him, and he, I will create a community for him. And verse 25, he says, Then the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. And it is talking about where there is acceptance, there is Love, there is genuine healing and reconciliation and restoration that is taking place. Now, you know, I, I want you guys to think about this, right? Tim Keller puts it, talking about love, he says, you know, it is our desire to be fully known and truly loved. But most of the time, our fear is that if we are truly known, uh, fully known, that we will not be truly loved. So we put up this facade, and we put on this act, and we behave in a certain way, and, you know, our, our, our social media is all about that, right? It's about portraying a picture of yourself and your family that is favorable so that people would think highly of you, then you really are. You know, I remember, uh, this is like six years ago or something, we were on a road trip, my family, you know, Jedi and Jeremy, and, you know, and Jeremy struggles with road trips because he gets motion sickness and you know, it's just not fun for him. And so, you know, we, we, we were go from Las Vegas, we were going to the, you know, Hoover Dam, and we were going to Grand Canyon, and we're doing all these things, and, and I, I, I got to take pictures so that I can show the world that what a great time our family is having. And at this 
uh, who were there? We were at these generators, and, uh, and I'm like trying to take a picture, and they're like, you know, and I'm like yelling at them, smile, you know, <laughs> like be happy. But I, I myself was so angry. I'm yelling at them to look happy because my fear is, you know, if I post a picture of our family where people are not, were, were not happy, then they're going to think like, oh, they have problems, they have issues. But you know deep down, if you think that people are loving you, a side of you that is not genuine, then there's this emptiness, like no one really loves me truly because I really haven't been able to show my true side out of fear of rejection and condemnation. The only true love that we experience is from God because only God fully knows us, yet he truly loves us. Amen? And then the second closest thing where we are given the opportunity to allow the other person to truly, fully know us, yet truly love us, is marriage. You know, in marriage, like, you can't hide stuff. Things come out. Things are discovered. You know, like, I try to eat, like, a snack at midnight, and I was like, what did you eat? I, you know, I'm just going down to, to get a drink of water. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, hurry up. <laughs> no. When you live together, and then there are reactions, there are expectations, and there are constant ebb and flow of your lives and values and personalities running into each other, you are discovered. And my prayer, especially to those of you who are married and are thinking about getting married, that you would have the courage and willingness to be truly and fully known by your spouse. It is a heavy, heavy weight to carry for the rest of your life a fake side of yourself, to play that role because you're afraid that you will not be truly loved. And then we have other relationships. We have relationships with our parents. We have relationships with our children, with our friends, we are, with our coworkers, and all these things. And God is calling us to be in this community setting so that in the community setting, not only are we loved by God, but that with the love and grace and healing that we experience in our relationship with God, that love, that care, that healing, that restoration is passed on to our relationship with other people. Jesus never called us to be an island. Jesus never calls us to be away from the community. I know many people are disappointed by the church. And I think it's been a season or two where a lot of spiritual giants have fallen, you know. Uh, and um, it is heartbreaking to hear our spiritual giants that they fell in this and fell in that. And then when the world highlights it, you know, there's that sense of disappointment, disillusionment, and disdain. And so some people can say, you know, I love Jesus but I don't like the church. I love Jesus, but I don't like the people in the church. Well, I'll say to you, if you truly love Jesus, then you would learn to love what he loves. And Jesus loved the church. And he gave himself up for the church. And so with, it, with all of the imperfections and brokenness and dysfunctions of the church, we learn to love. My family, when I was growing up, was the very definition of dysfunctional family. 
so much hurt, so much pain, so much anger, so much bitterness between my mom and dad, between the brothers, between the children and our parents. There's just, we are, we should have a family picture in there under the definition of dysfunction. That was us. But you know what? God doesn't say, okay, flip the table and start a new one. No, God says, let's work on your family. Let's bring healing. Let's bring forgiveness. Let's bring reconciliation. Let's bring restoration. Adam and Eve sinned. They were accusing each other, blaming each other, blaming God. And God didn't say, okay, let's separate you and start new. No, he said, let's work on your relationship. Look at Abraham's family. They hated each other. They sold their brother into slavery, told their dad that he was eaten by an animal and made him live in misery for years and years and years. One of the sons slept with the father's wife. I mean, talk about K-drama. Abraham's life was K-drama. God didn't say, wipe the slate clean, start over, I'll give you a new family. God says, let's work on your family. Let's bring your family into forgiveness, into restoration, into reconciliation. The nation of Israel rebelled against God and turned to idolatry and prostitution. God didn't do away with them, but God sends Jesus so that they can be restored, they can be forgiven, that the relationship can be restored. Same thing for you and I. We didn't know God. We rebelled against God. We were in active rebellion against God. And God didn't simply say, I condemn you, now go to hell. No, he said, I love you. And I want to reconcile my relationship with you. And I send my son to pay for the penalty of your sin. See, we were created to be part of God's community. We're created for community. Next slide. So when you look at the creation account, right? God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them, right? So the creation of humanity was not completed until Adam had a counterpart to belong to the community. It doesn't just say, oh, God created Adam and creation is done. No, it says very clearly he created man in his own image. And in the image of God, he created him. But then it goes on to say male and female, he created them. And when God created them, when they were able to form a community, the creation of man was completed. This is God's plan. This is God's desire. This is God's heart for us. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> All right. So Dallas Willard uh, says this, okay? He says, God's aim in human history is the creation of an inclusive community of loving persons with himself as its primary sustainer and most 
glorious inhabitant. God didn't create the community and, hey, duke it out. Hey, make it work. No. God designed the community, all loving, all inclusive community, where he would belong. Where, where he would be one of the inhabitants, most glorious, yes, but he still would be one of the inhabitants of this community, and he would be the primary sustainer of this community in his love and in his power and his provision. Yes, but God says, I want to belong in this community, and I invite you to be part of this community. Jesus calls it, you're my body, you're my church. We belong together. Jesus, he calls us unto unity. He doesn't call us to aloneness. He doesn't say, hey, you know what? People are bad, they're wicked, they, they kind of disappoint me, so I don't want you to hang out with people. I want you to go to the mountaintop all by yourself, and on that mountaintop, you will have deep, deep intimate fellowship with me. I want you to go to a faraway island where no one lives, and I want you to live there, but I will be with you, and you and I can have deep, intimate relationship. No, Jesus does not call us to that. He calls us to go into the world. He calls us to be the light and salt of this world. And especially among brothers and sisters in Christ, he says, you need to rub shoulders together. Things will get messy. They will hurt you. You will hurt them. You will be disappointed. But sometimes you will experience the joy of loving me together, growing together, experiencing the love of God and the power of God together. That we do life together. Why are you here? I know that first and foremost, you came to worship God. But secondly, and very high priority for all of us, you want community. You want deep, meaningful relationship. That's why we're here. That's the longing that God has put in our hearts. And so, I want us to remember that this is why we are called. And there is a cost of being part of the community. The cost of being part of the community is that you have to learn to love and learn to forgive. You know, I had a, like I said, we, you know, my family was so dysfunctional and so many hurt growing up. When I was getting married and when I having Jedi and Jeremy, I prayed and I told myself, I will never hurt them, I will never disappoint them. How that worked out? I failed. There were times I had to apologize. There were times I went to God in tears because I failed as a father. Same thing with me and my wife. I made a covenant before God and all the people who knew me that I would love her and honor her and cherish her and put her before my needs. That was my covenant. But many times I failed. Many times I hiss when she puts her cold toes into my leg. Not anymore. But, but how are we still together? How are we still loving God and serving God? Because there was forgiveness. Because there was reconciliation. Because there was restoration. God is not asking us to never mess up, to keep that clean sheet. No, God is saying, you will mess up, but you can forgive, but you can reconcile. You can learn to embrace. You can learn to wait. You can learn to pray. 
that is how we grow. That is how we become more like Jesus Christ. Think about this. Say you're living on an island all by yourself. No one to hurt you. No one to dis, uh, you know, discourage you. No one to uh, rile you up. And all you have is Jesus. And you're like, wow, that's great. I'm in love with Jesus. And every day is just great. But at the end of your life, you will, you will realize I have not grown at all. In humility, in forgiveness, in acceptance, in reconciliation, like in hoping. Like I've not grown in any way because I never had to deal with people who would bring situation and struggles into my life where we have to learn to forgive. We have to learn to love. We have to learn to embrace. With all its messiness, being part of God's community is so beautiful. And it is so worth it. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and on, you know, it's a passage you know very well. But he says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Okay, we get to, okay, I'm a new creation. But what am I a new creation for? Okay, we can say, I'm a new creation. I'm in Christ. I'm a new creation. Old has gone, new has come. But what am I a new creation for? Right? So therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Verse 18. All this is from God. Okay. Well, my uh, sermon notes are done. <laughs> Let me try to bring it up again. They say that's a sign of being old if you hate technology. Okay, here we go. So we are a new creation. Old has gone, new has come. Why? 18. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is in Christ God. No, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. So the reason we are new creation it's because we are now ambassadors of reconciliation. God is saying, hey, look at these people. These people have been reconciled to me, and you can now also be reconciled to us by the way you witness these people living in a community in unity. It just dawned on me. You cannot say community without unity. Ooh. <laughs> hey, but that's the purpose. Why are we new creations? Because God is entrusting us with the ministry of reconciliation. And ultimately, God wants the people to be reconciled to him, but see the best evidence of us being able to, to be reconciled with God is that when we live a life of reconciliation with people around us. The people around us. And so, you cannot say, I love God, but I hate people. Because if you love God, then you will also love people, even with 
all their imperfections. We are created for loving relationship. We are created for community. We are created to have this intimate loving relationship, not only with God, but with one another. We know that when sin came into the world, it broke the relationship. The relationship between God and man was broken. The relationship between man and woman was broken. The relationship between brothers was broken. But God says to us, I call you to belong to me as my sons and daughters. And I call you to belong to my community, my family as brothers and sisters. And the role of this community is to bring reconciliation. And, you know, as we start out the new year, and, you know, we're talking about New Year's resolution and plans and all these things. But as I shared with you, how does your plan align with God's plan for you? And God's plan for you is that you belong with God and you belong with the community. And I, I, I'll give you two very simple, basic, fundamental things that you need to do to belong in God's community. Be part of life group in a genuine way. Like, don't go like, oh, look how hot I am and look at, you know. No, just be your true self and say, this is who I am. This is my struggle. You know, like, I, I, when I was taking seminary, like, we had to go to, like, AA rehab and sit, sit there with them, kind of experience. Those people are brutally honest. I love it. It was so refreshing. They talk about not just alcohol, they talk about doing drugs, they talk about gambling, they, they talk about, oh my goodness, these people, like, but they're just so genuine. And he's like, yeah, you know, I was about to shoot up, but then, like, I realized I needed you guys more than I needed this, so I came. And their hug, their embrace, and they're celebrating as they share their brokenness. And that's what I mean. Like, don't just sign up for life group and do a Christian thing, a religious thing. No, join the life group and share your life, share your struggles, share your prayers, and then pray for others. Be part of God's community. And then secondly, and you have to do this. Belong to a ministry, serve. Because when you serve, you get healthy. When you serve, you're built up. You know, we're, we're muscles. And so when you don't serve, when you don't move, you don't get bigger and stronger. Your muscles get atrophy, right? Like we, and I think it's a miracle that Remnant Church has a running club. These guys run for fun or something. <laughs> and they actually qualified for marathon, right? Like, Woo, that's an achievement. Uh, but so they know, they know how to train for a marathon. How do they train? They keep running and they keep increasing the intervals or like how, how far they run. They kind of build up that stamina so that they can, on that day, run the 20 some miles that they have to run. Because my way of preparing for like the marathon would be like, for the next six months, I will just lie in my bed and just conserve all the energy because I think it's going to take a lot of energy to run that marathon. But can you imagine if I lied in the bed, laid, laid in my bed for six months because I wanted to conserve my energy and then I'm, and then like, okay, now I'm ready to run the marathon? You know, I'll be lucky if I can make it out of the first mile because I didn't develop my muscles, but I actually atrophy. Guys, same thing with living your life for Christ. I know that some of you are like, oh, I'm tired, Pastor Joe, and I'm resting. And I, I get that. Sure, you can rest. 
So when you rest too long, your heart grows cold. You get atrophied. And you actually discover that, wow, I am actually weaker than I was before going on my break. And so now I'm even more hesitant to serve. You have to keep running. You have to keep fighting. I've been serving the Lord for 30 plus years. Were there times where I was tired? Yes, I had those times. I fought through, I prayed through, I persevered. God is calling us to be part of his community. And the two basic things that you need to do as community, and I'm not, I'm not talking about your relationship with God. That's all another matter. To belong to the community in this church, practically, join a life group and belong to it in a genuine way. And number two, serve. Find an area where there's a need and serve. We need you. Uh, Last slide, and I'll finish with this. This is uh, (coughs) Hebrews 10. We know this. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And I think that is the key. This is the challenge I have for you. How are you being used by God to stir up your brothers and sisters in this church to love and good works? How are you being used by God to stir up passion for your brothers and sisters in your life to love, to do good work? If that's your ministry, that's your calling, we're called to that. We are to stir up one another to love, to good works. Let's bow our heads. It is our desire to be fully known and truly loved. And our prayer is that we will experience that in the community that God has called us into. We are weary of being fake, being superficial. Because if people like you for your fakeness, how meaningful is that? We want to be truly loved. And in God's community, that is the invitation. That is the calling that God has for us. In your community, learn to love, learn to extend, learn to embrace. Be the ministers of the reconciliation that God has accomplished through Jesus Christ. So can we take a moment and just respond to what God is saying to you? Respond to what his writing on the tablet of your heart right now. Say, Lord, I want to say yes to you. Lord, I want to respond earnestly. Help me to belong to the community that you have called me into. Let's go to the Lord. Let's pray.
Father God, we come before you. And Lord, we are so overwhelmed by the reality of your love for us. That you didn't simply keep us from being destroyed. You actually sought to reconcile with us that we would be in a genuine, loving, intimate relationship with you that you so wanted us to be. Meaningful part of your kingdom. And in that invitation, Lord, you call upon us to be the ministers of reconciliation, that we would be people who belong to you and to the community, and that we shine your light. And so, Lord, as we start out this year, Lord, would you invite us to be part of what you're doing? And Lord, would you invite us to belong to you and to the body of Jesus Christ? May our lives be offered to you as beautiful, fragrant offerings of thanksgiving. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's rise. Let's worship the Lord.